Good morning. Good morning again. Good to see you all. Man, the turnaround is quick. You never know how long those videos are. Sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes 40. Whew, it makes a difference. How are y'all? How are you doing? How's everyone? Good, good, good. Awesome. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Pastor Michael Jarbo. I haven't introduced myself yet. Lead pastor here at The Journey. I'm so thankful that you're in worship with us today. If this is your first time to The Journey, welcome. You can already see just a glimpse of us through the Athey family. Just a lot of fun, a great community of faith all on this journey of, of life and faith together. So I'm glad that you're here. And if this is your church home, welcome back. It's good to see you. Last Sunday, uh, Dr. Robbins and I did a little flippity flop and I preached in the sanctuary and he preached here at The Journey, which was cool to see some good uh, faces over at the sanctuary. But I'm glad to be back here for our final week, our final week of this So What series. Have you been enjoying it as much as I have? I've loved asking the big questions about our faith together with you. It has stirred a lot of coffee conversations. I am highly caffeinated during the week because of the sermon series. A lot of you are like, can we dig a little bit deeper? Can we go a little bit for like, yeah, we can, but just, man, how many, you know, like lattes am I going to drink in a row before I'm like, I can answer all your questions. Um, so, uh, but if you do have those big questions, my prayer is that the journey and MDUMC can be that space where you ask those hard questions. There are a lot of churches that encourage you to just stay quiet and just hear just believe what everyone else believes and you're good. But here we want you to wrestle with your faith. We want you to have an open space where you feel comfortable and your pastors are here for all of you. And that's what the theme and the heart of this series in January has been, asking those big questions of our faith. We've looked at the question of, will I be okay? Who am I? Where do I belong? And this week we're looking at the question, why Jesus? Like there's something about Jesus, the hymn, there's something about that name, right? There's something about Jesus that brought you here this morning. I know the bagels are fantastic and the coffee's pretty good, but what brought you to the journey this morning? Why Jesus? That's the question we're going to wrestle with this morning. Why Jesus? And we're going to do, through, uh, do so through a very um, mysterious, not talked about text that we don't know much. Have you, have you heard of John 3.16 before? It's a little... It's so one you may have heard of before. Uh, yeah, we're going to preach John 3.16 today. John 3.16 through verses 21. But we're going to look at it uh, in a bit of a different light and hear Jesus sort of answer the question of why Jesus. So we're going to read. If you got your Bibles, excelente. Open up to John chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. If not, the words are oh, already there on the screen. And we will read together. Again, I'm glad that you're in worship with us today. Here we go. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Everyone who believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. So as your pastor here at The Journey, I try my hardest to be up in front with you. Try to lay, lay it all out for you and be as honest as possible. So I have a confession to make to all of you in this room today is that I do not care too much for today's scripture. I don't. In fact, there are some times that I don't like it at all. And you might be thinking to yourself, and look, I know, I know, like, what is Jarbo thinking? Like anyone who's new here 
who's thinking he doesn't like John 3.16. Uh, oh, I got to go. I've got an appointment. Yeah, right? Like, why, why does he not think that? Why is this pastor rejecting the world's favorite Bible verse? You know, John 3.16, the verse has been translated more times than any literature in the history of literature. The verse that's been memorized by millions, millions of children across the world. The verse that is marked on players' faces to show you that they love Jesus and Jesus loves them if they win. I'm preaching this year at the confirmation uh, service. I'm really honored to be doing so. Uh, It's the first time I've done it before. I feel like I knew before I even... Uh, begin to write and compose this sermon that if I said this, it might like strip me of my biblical cred to confirmands who might hear this. I know they're in class right now, but if they're thinking, I mean, 11 o'clock, I'm I'm a little worried because I'm saying this because they're just going to think, okay, Pastor Jarbo, let the rumor spread now. It'll be on the cover of the messenger for next month. Doesn't like the one, the only John 3, 16. You know the verse. Why don't you just, why don't, you know what? A little test. Why don't you say it with me? Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you're quiet enough, you can hear Tim Tebow weeping somewhere far off in the distance with his John 3.16 strips on his face. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, let me just, let me explain a little bit, may I, uh, about where my, my distaste comes for this scripture. And let me a- start by asking you a question. And not the question, why Jesus? We'll get to that in a little bit. But let me perhaps start with an other one. What would it be like if someone died for you? What would it be like if someone died for you? I know it's a weird, odd question. I suspect a lot of you considering it in your head in just a short time I've given you would imagine some sense of gratitude that you might be feeling for the person. But now imagine that it wasn't just some sort of impulsive act of bravery. Someone just like pushed you out of the way of a car coming your way or something like that. Rather, Someone knew that you were in mortal danger and deliberately exchanged his or her life for yours. Well, then I think our minds would begin to switch a little bit from gratitude. And I don't know about you, but I feel this profound sense of debt. Right? Like, how can you possibly make it up to someone who has given it all up? for you, which is essentially the picture that Jesus here is painting and offering us for God. When we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he's not just simply referencing the baby in the manger. It's giving Jesus life over. It's giving Jesus life over to die, to die on a cross, to die for us. And this is why the church theologian Martin Luther calls this scripture the gospel in a nutshell. I don't know. There's, there's something kind of troubling, even scandalous at the heart of this scripture. Do you notice that God doesn't ask our opinion first before God does what God does? God doesn't ask our permission God doesn't even consult with us. God offers no objection, but just goes ahead and gives his son over to the cross for us. Do you see what I mean here? Are you following a little bit? Like there's part of me that's incredibly grateful, but part of me that's outraged. I mean, how dare God? How dare God sacrifice so much and by doing so claiming our lives and calling it his? It's not just scandalous, but it's a bit offensive to me. It's offensive because it leaves me without any room of my hopes, of my plans, of my wants, of my desires. It leaves me completely out of control. It's sort of like the scandal of infant baptism. Think about it, right? You just witnessed one right here. 
sweet Sadie getting baptized. I was baptized as an infant. Do I remember it? No. Maybe there's a little blanket that my mom has that I could remember from. I remember telling some friends in high school that I had been baptized as an infant, didn't really remember it, and they went, ah, you know what, Charbo? <laughs> you got to come to our summer camp during the summer. Okay, you can guess what denomination this was. We got pool baptisms. You can choose for your own. Come on to the waters. You'll like it. They do pool baptisms all night. You're going to love it. I had no idea peer pressure in high school would include drugs, alcohol, and rebaptism. <laughs> but if you think about it, that's what we do here at The Journey. We, we invite these young children up to the baptismal font before they can offer their consent and simply just put water on them, immerse them into God's love. How offensive. Some people might say that, that we don't even wait until they can decide for themselves. But that's at the heart of infant baptism. When you think of it, God just plain old adopts us. God makes us God's own. God pledges to be with us and for us forever. And whether we are ready, whether we are interested, whether we are eager to receive it or not, God is there for us waiting. And for that reason, I just think, that when we have those baptismal moments, we should add four words on to what Matthew's text shows us about baptism. I think we should say, you know, Sadie Claire, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, like it or not. Wouldn't that be nice? It reminds me uh, of this distant memory I, I had. I thought about this week during the summers, my family, we would love to go out to Tampa Bay, Florida, where all my family lived. It was like my parents in Dallas and then everyone else was in Tampa or, or Alabama, that sort of area. It was always fun seeing my family uh, across the way uh, and, and getting to see my cousins and my aunts and uncles, my grandparents. And I especially loved my Uncle Bob. Everyone's got an Uncle Bob, this big Italian man, full of heart, full of joy. His laugh would just shake the house. I mean, he was just, he was just that kind. I talked about brajol on Christmas Eve. Remember that, the Italian dish? My grandma here, Uncle Bob, like, beep, like right there. I mean, he could make the best food. And I remember one late night, I was with my cousin Steve and his son. We were about eight or nine watching old Godzilla movie reruns with the English translation at the bottom. You know what I'm talking about because that's what you do when you're eight or nine. And uh, it was time to go to bed. Uncle Bob came in and said, look, it's time to go to bed. And Steven, my cousin, was not having it. Like, uh-uh, nope, not having it. You as parents, you know when you've, you've had this experience before. Like, it's not going to happen. And he pushed and pushed and pushed for more time, and Uncle Bob wouldn't budge. And all of a sudden, in all of his rage and all of his frustration, Stephen got so mad that he erratically yelled, Daddy, I hate you! I was like on a beanbag chair, remember those? And I was like scooting back across the room like this is about to be not good. And like I was thinking, like you could see it process over Uncle Bob's face. Like was he going to toss him out to sleep in the front yard where gators and all sorts of stuff could get him or uh, just squash him or something like that. But he looked down at Steve and he goes, I'm sorry you feel that way, Steve, but I love you. And what do you think Stephen said? You think he said, oh, that's okay, cool, thanks, Dad. Do you think he said, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm in the wrong. I'm sorry, Dad. I love you too. No, he didn't say that. He looked at his uncle, he looked at my uncle, Bobby, he looked at his dad and he yelled back, don't say that, Daddy. And he's like, I'm sorry. And Uncle Bob said, I'm sorry. I, 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 it's true. I just love you, Steve. Don't say that, Dad. Don't say that again. I love you, Steve. I'm sorry. I love you. Please don't say that. And to finally end the back and forth, my Uncle Bob walked up to him and knelt down beside him and said, Stephen, now listen here. I love you. I'll never forget he said this. And you'll never know anything different. And Stephen, in that moment, just began to weep. <laughs> You see, even at eight years old, Stephen know, knew that in the face of unconditional love, he was powerless. He tried to negotiate. He tried to do his best, but it didn't work. See, if Uncle Bob had been willing to negotiate, 
I love you, Steve, only if you go to bed right now, then Stephen would have had the power. Stephen would have been in control. Okay, I'll go to bed, Dad, but tomorrow night, I'm not eating my vegetables. But once Uncle Bob refused to negotiate, refused to give conditions to his son, all Stephen could do was either accept or flee the love that Uncle Bob gave. See, friends, the same is true for every single one of us. If God makes God's great love for the world and us conditional, then all of a sudden we have the power. We can negotiate. We can threaten to reject God's love. We can even tell God, go take a hike if we don't like God's terms. But when God loves us completely and unconditionally, and God goes off and dies for us, well, then the jig is up. There's nothing that we can do to influence God. And that's exactly where and what happens in this verse. Listen to it again. Listen to it with that lens of God speaking. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And y'all, there it is. That's the gospel in a nutshell. God in Jesus has made God's decision and it is for us. And yes, we can run. And yes, we can try to change our relationship with God, but that doesn't change the fact that God loved us first and that God loves the whole world more than we can ever imagine. And so no wonder in the world's most popular Bible verse, is John 3, 16, because it is good news. Indeed, it is the best news. But before it's the best news and we can take that on, we have to realize that it is hard news. It's hard because we are not in control. Hard because it's not up to us. Hard because every time we hear how much God loves us, we also have to know we had nothing to do with it. We cannot influence it. And therefore, it is out of control. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but that makes me afraid. It makes me afraid because I've been trained by bitter experiences to believe that sometimes in situations, no one can really be trusted and that life is such a gamble. Life is so chaotic that we'd rather rather be in control no matter what. And so when God shows God's unconditional love to us, it frightens us a bit. It makes us do weird things. John goes on to say this in verse 19 today. This is a verdict, he says. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. When we desire to maintain any sort of semblance of control at any cost, we sometimes run away from that light. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we feel like we can just flee from God's beautiful embrace of us. And it's there when we find ourselves trapped in the darkness of our own devices. But then comes along life. Then comes along tragedy or whatever you want to call it. Something shakes us up. It presents us something utterly beyond our ability to cope, and it drives us to our knees in despair. What has it been for you? Has it been the loss of an important relationship, the death of a loved one, the return of an illness, the loss of a job, the unimaginable happens, and you realize, you realize in this flash of painful insight in those moments that you were never in control. You were never in control. None of your life, none of your circumstances, and certainly not in control of God. And all of a sudden, this difficult and disturbing, even offensive message of God's grace becomes the best news that you can imagine. Because here's the thing, friends, precisely because we are not in control of God and therefore not in control of our relationship with God, we realize that this is the one relationship in our life that we can't blow 
This is the relationship we can't screw up. God has taken responsibility for us, and God has promised through God's grace and God's Son, Jesus, to bring us to a good end. And this is why, to me, John 3.16 is so difficult and so defensive, but darn it, it's so hopeful. (laughs) It's so life-giving. It is why it is my least favorite verse in the Bible. But it's also my favorite verse in the Bible. (laughs) Because it promises us that God will never leave us. God will never let go. God will never take no for an answer. And when we are at our worst, God kneels down alongside us like Uncle Bob and says, I love you and you'll never know anything different. Now, does that mean that we don't have to do anything in this relationship? We can be hands off. We don't have to contribute to anything. Definitely not. We have been witnesses of great love in this life through God's grace So we have to respond. We have to honor God by sharing the good news of God's love for the world who who so needs it. And this is where the why Jesus question comes up. And you might be thinking, why did he wait? Why did Jarva wait to the end to talk about why Jesus? And the answer is, I didn't, y'all. I've been talking about this entire time. We've been talking about this story of God's grace and God's love. But the reality is Jesus actualizes it. We realize God's love in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus literally embodies that love, or as a message version says of John 1, chapter 4, verse 14, which I love, God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's a good line. That's a good line. Jesus says these words to both these devoted disciples who are standing there in John 3, and like also the solid skeptics like Nicodemus, who was trying to figure it out. And he wasn't giving him these words that I read this morning to you as a sign of bad news, as a sign of guilt, or to show the receipts. Like, here's the debt you owe me because I'm going to die for you. That's not Jesus. Jesus says these words to answer the question, why Jesus? Because in Jesus, through his life and through his death and through his resurrection, we might actually get to witness this incomparable love lived out that we can only know and model because of God's grace. It gives us this strange ability as Christians, as Christ followers, if we actually do that, in the face of life's hurdles, to believe in ourselves, to believe in each other, to believe in forgiveness. Is there someone you need to forgive in 2020? Someone on your heart you need to forgive. It gives us the power to believe in hope. It gives us a strange ability to see others as all, not just some, not just a few, not just a selected few, as all recipients of God's grace, despite our differences. Jesus says, I want you to work on being messengers of my love, not managers of my love. We love to manage. How can we be messengers? So brothers and sisters of the Journey 930 service, hear this word of judgment (laughs) and promise at the same time in this passage. A verse I just struggle with, but a verse I love more than any. You are not in control. Can I say that again for the people in the back? You are not in control, and that should be hard to understand But the God who has created the vast cosmos, the God who has cosmos, the God who has created the world will also hold you in the vast chaos of your life. God will love you when you feel unlovable. God will bring you to eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. As St. John, the writer, speaks about the death and resurrection of Jesus, he says these words that we hold true again today. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And might I add, like it or not. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you so much thanks for this scripture. 
we have got it memorized, but sometimes we don't realize the power behind those words, the, the depth of meaning. Jesus was speaking of something deeper than what you can just tattoo on your body or, or have memorized in your pocket. Jesus was inviting us into a story of deep love, of grace, and saying, let me be that story lived out for you. And when you see it, model it, follow it, take it in, let it reside within your heart, with your soul. And then once you get there, then be, be messengers of it. We love to control God's love. We like to be judge, endure. But we just ask that you, by your grace and truth, can hold us, can comfort us, and give us the hope we need, the hope to hold on. That's our prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.